Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to uh, be with us in this uh, closing session. And we have um, an amazing um, um, guest, a special guest, uh, Paris Aslamidis. Thank you so much to be here with us and to uh, and accept our invitation. Of course, thank you very, very much for having me here. I'm uh, very excited and honored. Uh, to be your keynote speaker. Awesome. So this is the closing session. Uh, the conference uh, is called Bridge on Populism and Frame Theory. Uh, this is the, uh, as I said, uh, closing session of the university seminar on Frame Theory and Populism. Uh, this part of the research project AMLO, Frame Theory and Populism, a transversal study of the policy of the whole transformation. Um, I will change my uh, language in Spanish and English. So, <laughs> muchísimas gracias a todas y todas por estar el día de hoy con nosotros en esta tarde. Eh, para nosotros es muy especial tener a nuestro invitado, eh, a, a Paris Alandis, que ha estado con nosotros para cerrar nuestro eh, seminario universitario sobre el marco populista en este año 2022, el cual forma parte del proyecto PAPIT y A302721. Uh, con el título El marco populista de AMLO, un estudio transversal de la política eh, de la 4T. So, uh, let me introduce our special guest, uh, 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 Rip Dio, because everyone here knows him. Uh, Paris, as we know, is a lecturer of political science at Yet University and the Department of Political Science at Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. His works analyze the populism phenomenon with a focus on grassroots social movements. He's also interested in the intellectual history of populism and its sociology of knowledge. So again, Paris, thank you so much to be here with us. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's really an honor uh, to be addressing your audience uh, at the closing of, of your two-year uh, project. Um, I, I know you're probably tired of uh, hearing about populism for the past couple of years, but uh, you'll have to suffer another half hour or so uh, uh, to, to hear my uh, side of the story, I guess. So uh, I will try not to bore you too much. Uh, the idea here is to, um, uh, is to just highlight the main issues I had when I started doing my research on populism with the uh, major theoretical par paradigms out there and why I was, I was looking for something, uh, something new. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if, uh, no, I'm not sure if uh, you can see the, the slide. Can you see the slide changing? Is that yes. right? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, there's a lag with the YouTube uh, channel. That's now now I get it. Uh, and uh, how? Uh, so the second thing is, uh, um, you know, my my story of how I decided to introduce uh, frame theory into my work, and I will argue in favor of the advantages of uh, doing that. And uh, my uh, my quest as a scholar since then has been uh, mostly to urge uh, scholars to. Um, take note of populism when it happens on, uh, at the grassroots level and not only uh, see it when, uh, when it manifests at the party uh, system level. So it's my, uh, I guess it's my, um, my um, uh, idea that sociologists and political scientists uh, and of course other sub-disciplines in our or even political theorists uh, can come together and study uh, populism as a more general phenomenon, not only at the party system level. And I think uh, frame theory helps in, um, in that respect, uh, both theoretically and methodologically. So um, where did my inspiration come um, from? It came from um, my home country, Greece, uh, where I was in 2011. I don't know if you remember that. My students don't because you know, they were very too young, but you probably remember the debt crisis uh, after 2009, 2010 in Greece and in, in Europe in general, but Greece was, you know, the bed noir at the time. So things were happening and uh, there was this um, big, um, um, uh, there was this large movement, uh, the so-called indignados in, uh, in Spanish, but uh, it's, it's called aganactismen in Greek. You don't, you don't need to know that or remember that. It was this popular uh, movement from the grassroots, not really uh, associated with any political party. It was, it was kind of unique. We hadn't seen that in, in decades 
if, if or more than that in uh, in Greece, and it had elements that were for a lot of people obviously uh, populist, right? So uh, the idea there was to uh, to really try to study to see whether we can make the case of you know witnessing a populist movement happening and its political implications at the party system level, of course, and at the same time to see how this thing called populism operates at the grassroots when it doesn't have to do with the electoral arena or anything like that. It doesn't have to do with pop political parties, right? And I started doing that and I um, um, I started having ideas about our, uh, our literature in populism at the, on populism at the time. Uh, it seemed to me that it was exclusively focused on, uh, on the party system and it wasn't giving me uh, adequate tools to uh to do research on populism as a as a social movement and you know i i wanted to change that i wanted to come up with a theoretical framework that that allows uh, a researcher to again to study populism as a more general phenomenon uh so the major paradigms at the time uh, and, and still today uh, of course are uh, you know the thin center ideology framework by Kasmude. Uh, Ernesto Laclau's uh, post-structural framework, and of course, uh, especially in Latin America, very famously, uh, Wayland's approach uh, to populism. For different reasons, I'll, I'll go into that a bit later. I wasn't, um, I, I, I felt uneasy with these uh, frameworks because again, they there was a lack of focus on what happens when uh, things kick off uh, on, the, on the ground, the grassroots level. Laclau a bit less than uh, the other two, but I, um, I I had a few issues with that um, as well. So, of course, since I was starting a social movement, I had to delve into the literature of social mobilization, which is mostly sociological, as, as you know. Uh, the major schools of thought there are resource mobilization, political opportunity, and frame theory. And almost from the beginning, frame theory struck me as something totally compatible with, uh, with populist uh, mobilization. Uh, I felt that there were so many affinities between how um, how frame analysis sees the construction of, of popular grievances and their mobilization, and what was happening uh, uh, with the Indignados movement in Greece and with other similar movements uh, around uh, around Europe and other uh, other countries, other play, other other regions of the world. Um, so my first impressions after delving, uh, after mastering more or less the literature on populism and, and also the literature on social movements, was that um, my subfield was kind of lopsided. Uh, there was too much work on uh, on uh, populists at the uh, party system level. Even if, especially in the case of of European politics, those populists were commanding something like two or three percent of the electoral vote, so really significant compared to, for instance, you know, Latin America. Uh, at the same time, there was too little work, if any, on uh, grassroots populism. And even though populist movements, in my opinion, are not, not rare at any case, they're, they're, they're rather frequent. They just uh, pass under the radar uh, for some reason. Um, so uh, my quest, as I said earlier, was to uh, try and bridge this gap that existed try to restore some balance uh, so that uh, people working on populism will finally start noticing uh, populist invocations, populist manifestations when they take place in a non-institutionalized manner outside of you know, the strictly electoral uh, arena of, um, of politics. And I, uh, I started seeing this phenomenon uh, having a uh, you know, a, a large breadth, actually. Uh, and uh, I mainly studied the uh, so-called uh, movements of the Great Recession that started in 2008 after the collapse of Lehman Brothers in, in the US. You, you, you know this story. And uh, the first movement in that, as sociologists would call a cycle of contention or cycle of protest, took place in Iceland in 2008, the, the so-called pots and pans revolution. In, in Spanish, uh, of course, you know this as a caserolazo, right? In uh, mainly in, uh, from Argentinian politics, uh, and then it, it kind of spread from uh, from Iceland, and I, I I felt that all these movements had something in common, and the populist element in them was very very pronounced. Of course, you also had the Arab Spring taking place at the same time uh, after 2010 in Tunisia, 2011 in uh, in Egypt, and so on. 
I felt that there was, you know, uh, th th there was a very uh, pronounced populist uh, element uh, there as well. But then when it crossed the Mediterranean again in, in Portugal in 2011, most famously in Spain in uh, the same year in May, and then in Greece, as I said, in uh, again late May, and uh, even in Israel later, later on in July, and uh, the most famous on this side of, of uh, the Atlantic, perhaps Occupy Wall Street in 2011, 2012. I felt that these movements had something in common. And of course, I'm not the first one to say this, right? There, there are many other people who have uh, studied this. But my uh, my understanding was that we need to find a way uh, to emphasize the, the, the populist element uh, uh, in these movements. And as I said, the literature I had uh, in my hands was not uh, uh, was not helping me uh, uh, do that. And there were many other movements later on. I mean, we can talk about them for uh, for hours, I guess, in many other parts of the world after 2011, and they're still happening. And of course, they they have happened in the past. The I mean, uh, every handbook on populism will tell you that the first two populist cases historically were the uh, you know the People's Party in the United States, which started as a movement, actually the Farmers Alliance, and the Narodniki movement in Russia. So, populism as a concept has a history that understands it's the phenomenon as as a grassroots thing but it kind of got forgotten um along the way and uh we uh we turned uh, to focus almost exclusively on the on the party system so it was this tradition that i was trying to uh, to revive in a way you can, you can see it that way now let's uh talk about the schools of thought and what were my main uh, problems uh, with them at the time so first, you have uh, Muda's thin-centered ideology framework. Um, a lot of work with also with his uh, associate uh, Cristobal Rovira Kaltwasser. Very important work. The dominant school uh, right now, still in in populism studies. I always thought that uh, populism is not coherent enough to be an ideology. Um, I also felt that uh, this thin-centered. Uh, concept that goes back to the work of uh, Michael Frieden and his morphological approach to ideologies was kind of methodologically vague. Well, I mean, if it's if populism is an ideology, where exactly do you look for it? I, I guess uh, policy platforms or, or something like that. But at the same time, we know that populism exists on the left and right. You know, the, the famous uh, duo here is uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump in the United States. How can they both share an ideology that we call uh, uh, populism, right? It, when they are on, on opposite sides of the political spectrum. And I felt like whenever you would pressure uh, people, you would put pressure on you know, disciples of this uh, view on, you know, how, how can you claim that uh, they are both populist? The answer was usually, look at what they're saying, right? So they would fall back on the, on the discursive approach uh, in a way. So I, I never really uh, bought the idea that uh, ideology, uh, populism is an ideology. I mean, even uh, there, there are also problems with um, normative evaluations. This literature started more mostly in Europe on uh, from uh, scholars on uh, of the radical right. So it had an understanding that mostly uh, applied to uh, um, right wing uh, politics, uh, and also um, I mean. The, the, it's a bit of opaque on what is a thin centered ideology and what is not. Frieden famously a couple of years ago or a bit more said, who is the originator of this uh, idea, said that uh, populism is not, according to uh, his opinion, a, uh, a thin centered ideology. So, I mean, who's to say really? Uh, so for those reasons, I, I kind of started distancing myself from uh, from this school of thought. Then you have uh, Kurt Weyland, uh, who's the uh, originator of this idea of populism strategy, especially in, in Latin America, almost exclusively in Latin America, which of course I could not use on, uh, on, uh, on populist mobilization because for Weyland, populism is strictly electoral and it has to do with this, um, with the existence of this opportunistic leader who kind of manipulates uh, the voters and uh, makes them vote for him or her. It's usually him, right? Um, and and that's it, right? Uh, I I felt that uh, this is not the full picture for uh, for populism, and of course, it doesn't apply at the grassroots level because it's, it it has it has to be top down according to uh, to Wayland, right? No, my my view was was different because I saw populism happening on the ground from non-electorally inclined people. And I um, I felt that this 
should uh, should be reflected in a definition of uh, populism. And the third school is, of course, Laclau's uh, post-structuralist, uh, post-Marxist school of thought. Um, it really has been inspiration uh, for me. Uh, at the beginning, I uh, I I uh, didn't understand much, but uh, gradually I um, I um, I started having a lot of respect for his work, and my work is uh, is heavily influenced by uh, by Laclau. But uh, so mostly because of the fo this focus on agency, uh, the important role of discourse in uh, in populism. But I have a few points of departure uh, from Laclau in my work. And it mostly has to do with this idea that populism um, always has to do with uh, group demands. It doesn't go down to the individual level. While I think that uh, we can, again, as individuals, um, have populist sensitivities without necessarily seeing them as group grievances. And also my most important uh, uh, problem was uh, this Freudian uh, connection to the leader, this libidinal connection to the leader that uh, populist uh, masses have, according to Laclau. And uh, I had you know, already studied uh, uh, cases where this, this connection did not really exist and still populism was able to operate uh, on the ground uh, uh, straightforwardly without you know, violating any of the other um, um principles that Lacla would uh, would put forth right so I felt that this was partly uh, influenced by his uh, Latin American experience in, in Argentina mostly and also to from his readings on uh, you know psychoanalysis and Freud uh, but I thought I was thought this is superfluous and I still do believe that uh, you know this is not a necessary uh, piece of of the whole uh, puzzle so uh, I switched to uh, frames and framing uh you, you know the uh, the literature. Uh, most of you know the literature. I I, I read uh, some of your work, uh, so I don't want to go into details here. Uh, but for those who are not um, uh, uh, who don't know the, the, the this uh, school of thought very well, uh, we start with the notion of the frame. What what is a frame? It's it's a way to interpret, simplify, and condense what is going on out there by selectively uh, uh, um, punctuating specific objects or situations or events and experiences within our, uh, within our environment. And uh, Snow and Benford are highly successful sociologists, of course. Their work has been uh, applied to all sorts of different uh, types of social movements. They, have, they also have this uh, rich reservoir of accompanying concepts. I will not go into them. Frame alignment, for instance which um, yeah, Israel and, uh, and Jorge and their associates used in, in, their, in one of their publications always shared with me. Uh, the constraining factors, uh, framing, what they call boundary framing, uh, frame disputes that, are, uh, that I also did uh, observe in my, um, in my field research and, and, and master frames. Um, but I don't wanna uh, bore you with that. I will just give you a simple example to show you how framing works. So here's a framing example. Uh, a boat with refugees arrives at the uh, at our shores, you know, in country X, right? And we have this breaking news broadcast, which says, "Safe at last, more than 100 refugees fleeing the Syrian war reach our shores." Right. So this is a framing of of this situation, what's happening in our immediate uh, environment, right? We have this picture, and this is how we frame it. This is how we we try to make meaning out of it, right? Uh, but the idea with framing and with constructivist sociology in general is that uh, reality is not a given. It is interpreted. It uh, um, it has to do with how we 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 give meaning to uh, to the symbols and the, the and the uh, the actions that people uh, uh, take or engage in. So a different sort of framing could be something like this: the invasion continues. More than one hundred immigrants entered our country illegally this morning. Right. So. In other words, the, uh, the, 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 the social content is similar, right? Objective reality, if you want to call it that, uh, of course, uh, you know, constructivists would not agree, but what is happening out there, to put it in simpler words, uh, uh, is X, but how we interpret it, the meaning we give it, and of course, in our case, for political purposes, differs. It all has to do with how we frame a situation, right? So we should see collective action frames, uh, frames that have to do with how people uh, come together to, uh, uh, to, uh, to challenge authority, for instance. 
as emergent and action-oriented set, sets of beliefs and, uh, and meaning. As I said earlier, and of course, as Snow and Barefoot have, uh, have emphasized, it's signifying work, right? It's an active, uh, it's an active process uh, to, to frame what is going on out there. It has to do with your agency as a political entrepreneur, in a way, or as, or as an activist. And it all uh, comes down to the level of uh, reality construction at the end of uh, the day. I know that a lot of people have a hard time uh, uh, agreeing with that because they see reality as something more objective. But, um, you know, I, uh, I, I subscribe to this uh, uh, school of thought and, uh, you know, this is how I see uh, political phenomena as well. So collective action frames specifically, this is uh, our main focus here. Uh, they uh, they put attention in a particular situation that's considered problematic, right? There's a problem there that we need to interpret. They make attributions regarding to uh, who or what is to blame, right? Who's to blame for what is happening to us? And they articulate an alternative set of arrangements, right? So in uh, frame analysis lingo, we talk about the core framing tasks. First, the three, three framing tasks. First, you have the uh, diagnostic uh, framing task which is identifying the problem and uh, attributing uh, blame or causality. Then you have the prognostic framing part where you suggest solutions to this problem, but you also identify specific tactics and targets. And then the third and less important uh, task is motivational framing, which is like a, a call to arms or, or a call to action. Let's try to understand how this works in the case of uh, populist mobilization specifically now. So how would a uh, populist activist uh, or politician even uh, uh, try and do that? So the diagnostic framing would look something like this. Our various grievances, the populists would say, are the outcome of a loss of popular sovereignty, right? That's how you diagnose the problem out there. And the elites are to blame. That's, that's your blame attribution, right? We, we know this very well from populist, uh, from, from you know, the major schools on, on populism. Uh, how does a prognostic framing look like? Well, here it gets trickier for populism. And I, th I think that populism is notoriously weak in terms of providing a, a resonant prognostic frame. It's very good with the diagnostic frame. This is you know, the gist of populism. But when it comes to providing solutions, uh, usually the, uh, the framing is vague. The, the answer is, you know, we need to regain popular sovereignty and then our problems will more or less solve themselves, right? And in terms of motivation and framing, I mean, we don't need to spend too much time here, you know, famous slogans like this, prodding people to action uh, by elaborating on your diagnostic and prognostic framing is like uh, the, the, the easy part of, of the uh, equation. But there's a missing link in my opinion. So I was very happy with uh, how uh, populism uh, uh, fits with frame theory. Uh, but I felt that there's a, a lack of emphasis in frame analysis on the issue of collective identity, which is pivotal for, for populist mobilization. So in order to um, account for that, I started studying uh, social psychology a little bit, uh, and especially social psychologists that work on uh, social mobilization, sociological social psychology, as we call it, um, which, I mean, I was always uh, in agreement that collective uh, identification is a significant predictor of, uh, of mobilization. And specifically in, uh, in populism, those two categories that we constantly mention, right, in our subfield, people and elites are social categories, right? And they're, and they're socially constructed. You know, the, the people don't really exist. I mean, political theorists have done great work on this. It's how you interpret the term, the people. And the same can be said for, uh, for, for elites, even though, you know, in populist rhetoric, depending on the context, elites can be, can be named uh, specifically. But generally, I felt that in order to mobilize uh, for populism, diagnostic framing and prognostic framing, uh, motivational framing are very important factors, but they have to be intertwined with this idea that we can call I collective identity framing, right? You need to persuade people uh, citizens or voters uh, that they are part of what you call, you know, the, 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 what you have constructed as the people, right? If you don't do that, it's very difficult to, uh, to create a successful uh, populist uh, movement. So the idea is that we need to turn from uh, individual psychology, psychology that Laclau mostly employs, for instance, to social psychology, right? Populist entrepreneurs construct they politicize uh, the social identity of the people. That's very important, politicizing a social identity in order 
you know, to get them out in the streets and protest against uh, the government or the elites in general. And, um, and thus they benefit from uh, what we call self-categorization, right? They start favoring the in-group, the people, and they uh, and, and there's this phenomenon of out-group uh, derogation against the elites, which which kind of solidifies the collective uh, identity. So this is the uh, you know this is a core part of the mechanism of uh, of popular mobilization, in my opinion. I'll I'll give you some more details here on, uh, on collective identity. Bear with me, please. So, according to social identity theory, which is uh, which is the uh, I guess go to uh, uh, school uh, nowadays, the self is comprised of a hierarchy of social identity, right? Think about it. We are, uh, we might be Mexicans, um, um, Americans, uh, we might have a religious identity or a sexual identity that's very important for us, or an identity that comes from the, you know, football team that we support, and I mean football in terms of soccer here, remember? Uh, we uh, it might have to do with our um, uh, with our interest in music, you know the, the the kind of music we like, the subcultures that we uh, uh, we belong to. We have a series of social identities that we carry every day, right? And uh, in different times of uh, of the day, we like pick a card and play play that role in a way. The role of the father, for instance, the role of uh, you know the heavy metal fan, or the the role of uh, the supporter of uh, Guadalajara soccer team, things like that, right? Uh, so a social identity, according to the definition by uh, Henri Taifel, who was a pivotal figure in uh, social identity theory, is that part of an individual self-concept which derives from his knowledge of his membership in a social group, right? We understand that we belong in these uh, social groups. And this, our membership has, has an emotional content that is, is highly, highly uh, uh, significant here. So by self by the by the act of self categorization by putting ourselves by placing ourselves as members of these of these uh, uh, let's say communities uh, right, or groups, uh, what is produced is depersonalization. So we tend to define and see ourselves less as differing individual persons and more as the interchangeable representatives of some shared social category membership, right? So we need to switch, we switch from an I behavior to a we behavior when you find yourself in a concert, you know, watching your favorite uh, uh, singer uh, uh, on stage, when you find yourself in a soccer uh, stadium, when you find yourself in a, uh, in a political rally, right? It's, it's not so much about yourself, you understand that you're part of a larger we. Now, of course, you already, I guess, uh, you already see the connection with uh, with populism here, right? This, this switching from I behavior to we behavior. So uh, social identity theory asks, when do we adopt a positive social identity? Then, then, because you can't just adopt any identity out there, right? So there has to be what they say, what they call comparative fit, uh, which works along the uh, meta contrast principle. We need to perceive our Intra-class differences are differences within the set, right? As significantly smaller compared to inter-class differences. So um, again, I'm going to use the the example of soccer fans. We know, you know, you're sitting next to a person, you're supporting the same team. Uh, you know that they, you may have differences in terms of uh, your your politics, for instance, right? Uh, but while you're there, while this social identity of of a fan is uh, is active. You don't pay attention to that, right? Your interclass uh, uh, differences, your interclass differences are not so important. What is important is your difference to the other guys, you know, the supporters of the other, of the other team, right? The normative hip fit says that um, our uh, membership in this group must exhibit some consistency with our general normative beliefs, right? I mean, if you if you're an anti-fascist. And you support this uh, this soccer team that has uh, clearly fascist tendencies, you know, like Lazio, for instance, in Italy, right? Most famously, you you won't feel comfortable with that, right? There, there needs to be some some consistency uh, here. This is what we call normative fit. Now let's go back to populism. How can populists foster self self categorization into the group? Because you know this is this is what they need to do if. If they uh, if if they have to persuade people to go out in the streets and 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 uh, join their movement or to vote for for them in uh, in elections, what is the social identity they politicize? 
my uh, my claim is that uh, populism has to do with the politicization of citizen identity, right? We're all citizens uh, or societal members, if you want to call it that way. Uh, and this carries uh, huge implications for politicization, right? Um, it's a membership group. We're just citizens and we don't feel it necessarily. We don't use it. We don't employ it in our daily lives. But when someone comes and, uh, and turns that from a membership group into a reference group, you are the people, you're a citizen, so you're a part of the people, so you need to, you know, rise against what is going on in our country. Suddenly, this, this latent social identity of the citizen becomes politicized, and you become, you know, until then, you might have been simply an allegiant citizen, but suddenly you become an assertive uh, citizen, right? You, you understand that uh, um, citizenship comes with with rights, perhaps, and that there is this thing called popular sovereignty, and it is your it is your uh, your given right to uh, uh, to revolt against injustice and to to seek accountability from your rulers and to seek transparency or even to overthrow the government that is not uh, serving the interests of the people, but instead is serving the interests of uh, of elites. Right. So this is how ra radicalization, if you want to politicization uh, happens in um, in my opinion. And of course, agency is important here. Somebody has to build that collective action frame, which includes that, that logic, right? Um, and this agency comes either from, you know, in the electoral arena, either from the politician or from the movement entrepreneur, the populist movement entrepreneur in, uh, in grassroots uh, mobilization. So, uh, to I mean to conclude, I guess uh, here a bit. Uh, depersonalization instills this realization that you are not to blame for the problems you're facing. Right, your your problems are derived from the decision making pro uh, process. They have to do with the redistribution process. They have to do with how politics works in your country, and that allows you that justifies. The politicization of your citizen uh, citizenship identity, and turn you into, let's say, a, a populist, right? And populism does have uh, rather rather straightforward comparative and normative fit with uh, with a lot of people, I believe. Why? Because it's unassailable to claim that uh, the notion of the people is uh, symbolically recognizable by most of us. You know, we all, most of us, live in countries. That had their constituent moments when the people rose up and uh, created, in many cases, our uh, our nation states. You know, the Mexican Revolution or the Greek Revolution or the French Revolution. There are all these, as as Frank has uh, famously uh, wrote, there are all these constituent moments that have instilled the notion of popular sovereignty, uh, and that, of course, works in in uh, in mostly democratic states. But even in, in authoritarian states, there's this objective. To create a constituent moment, right, and and, and restore or or inaugurate uh, democracy, and, and so the notion of the people has always has this this very pregnant, you know, essence to it. It can it can really be activated, um, uh, and it's not easy to uh, uh, to attack it on it on, on moral grounds, right? Because again, I mean, even liberal democracy. Is partly based on on popular sovereignty, right? How can you easily argue against people who, you know, the only thing they uh, they claim to 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 represent is, you know, serving that principle, right? It's also uh, very permeable. You know, it, it, it's it's very easy for uh, for any of us to um, to claim that yes, we are also part of the people, right? You don't need to change many things in your understanding of the world or, or politics. Right? It's not the same as switching, you know. Partisan identities or, or sexual identities or anything like that, right? It's it, the, the boundaries are very, very permeable, right? And that allows populist entrepreneurs to e more easily recruit, uh, uh, you know, citizens compared to you know somebody who ask a Republican to become a Democrat, uh, for instance, in the United States. And the in group is as wide as possible, right? I mean, the ninety nine percent famously uh, with Occupy Wall Street is is the people. It's just there's just a tiny minority of elites who are not. Or by definition excluded uh, from the people. So these are very powerful weapons uh, in, in, in terms of social psychology that uh, populist entrepreneurs can, uh, can mobilize, right? 
Um, and they're also very vigilant about it. Uh, so in the movements I've studied, um, the identity that uh, you are uh, allowed to employ as, as a member of these movements is the populist um, identity, right? Of course, you can come to a populist congregation you know, with your racial identity or with your um, religious identity. And uh, if, if there's nobody fit with, with the cause of the movement, you may be allowed to, um, to express that, right? But these other identities uh, cannot be seen as taking over, cannot be seen as undermining the primacy of, of the populist identity that we are the people, right? And uh, I've, seen, I've seen many cases where um, there were frame disputes or, or, uh, or, or real disputes, physical disputes between activists when they felt that uh, people were coming into the movement that had already you know, constructed this populist identity with different social identities that they wanted to politicize, right? That, uh, and, and usually this is, this is what, um, uh, what makes populist uh, grassroots movements uh, disintegrate. It's usually some sort of dispute uh, either about identity or about policy. Um, so no other we identities are allowed to uh, to operate at the top level in uh, in populist uh, movements. Uh, at the same time, another uh, artifact of the whole process here is that um, is out group homogeneity uh, in a sense, right? So we start all looking alike. We're we're you know we're populists. We're in favor. We're part of the people. You know we're we're one. We're the ninety nine percent, right? And against us, we have these elites, and all the elites start looking alike. So you start, you know, you start marking the boundary between in-group and out-group in very, very stark terms, right? And this, of course, helps with um, uh, with mobilization. So the outcome is a dichotomous identity space. Uh, you know, um, the audience is presented with this stark question: Are you with the people, or are you with uh, with the elites? Right? It's a very it's a morally very powerful um, uh, question, uh, and it can um, it has worked. I've I've, I've seen it work uh, fabulously fabulously with uh, with populist mobilization, especially in um, in cases like Greece, where the uh, the party system you know was mostly crumbling and partisan identities stopped becoming stopped being so strong. Uh, the populist identity is really a very a uh, good way to rally people under, you know, a new non-partisan, non-ideological uh, flag. Um, and you can also see it as an, um, as an interplay between identities, positive identities, like being of the people and anti-identities, uh, being against the elites, right? And I think a lot of people are recruited um, in, uh, in populist movements using this using the the, the anti-establishment component uh mostly right the anti-identity we are you know we hate the elites right that's that's why we are members of the people they don't necessarily not not everybody starts necessarily with the idea that we are members of the people we are we are here to denounce elites you know it, it, it can come from from both uh, uh directions now i'll summarize and uh, move on with uh, the social psychological advantage of populist discourse so almost uh, uncontested availability of uh, comparative and uh, normative fit because of this idea of, of the people being behind the construction of uh, especially the nation state in the modern world. Uh, low entry of uh, cost of self categorization it's easy. You don't need to, to relinquish much politically in order to become part of a, of a populist uh, uh, movement when it's seen as a partisan, non-ideological, non-religious and so on and so forth. No sectional interests come in the way. There's no class element necessarily, right? Um, within the movement, if if the social identity of the people starts becoming resonant, uh, you you start censoring uh, other meta contrast calculations that will again prioritize class, for instance, or uh, or religion or uh, or race. And the last uh, element, it creates strong group cohesion identity commitment, things that a movement needs, right, in order to prosper. Uh, and this is due to the dichotomization of uh, social space, right? To recap, how do we identify a populist uh, movement using frame, uh, frame analysis and, you know, borrowing a few things from uh, social identity theory? We can see populism as a collective action frame. 
not as an ideology, not as a uh, strategy by um, opportunistic leaders, but as a, an anti-establishment discourse in the name of, um, of the people, right? The core normative value in uh, populist movements is popular sovereignty. It has to be, I mean, if it's not popular sovereignty and it's like national sovereignty, then you're talking about nationalist movement, really. If it's about, uh, you know, working class identity, you're talking about a, a left-wing or socialist uh, uh, movement. Uh, we need, I mean, I, I tried my work to be precise about um, how I use these, uh, these terms. Uh, and you have to study its rhetoric. Uh, is there a populist collective action frame at work? Can we categorize this uh, movement as, as a populist one? How are its framing tasks articulated? Are they articulated in a way that follows the populist diagnosis and the populist prognosis? Are the movement's demands framed in a people versus elite trope? This, these are the questions I think you need to, um, to study, to, to, to answer through your uh, research in order to uh, uh, identify a movement as a, as a uh, populist one. And then you move on to identity. You know, if you, I, I'm gonna talk about the methods in, uh, in the next slide. What, who do they claim to be the protesters? Do they claim to be the people? Do they claim to be something else? Do they claim to be the working class? Do they claim to be Christians, for instance, or, or Muslims or something like that, right? This will give you a good hint on whether popular sovereignty is really the, the, the core value here. Do, do, you, uh, do you see them guarding vigilantly their collective identity against other sectional identities that might cut through you know, that might impose a, an inner boundary that, of course, you, you want to avoid as a populist. And how does the outgroup look like? How do they, how do they portray it, right? Is it a homogeneous elite? Is it, uh, what kind of elite uh, is it, right? And why are they seen as defrauding the people of, uh, of popular sovereignty, right? By, uh, you know, using your microscope to, well, actually not your microscope, you can use uh, things like, Participant observation to avoid the uh, metonymies here. Uh, you can use interviews, text analysis, of course, uh, assembly minutes. All the uh, or most of the movements uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, they were organized around a, a general assembly where each person was each member was more or less able to uh, go on stage and uh, express their their, their grievances. Uh, of course, speeches, right? Most importantly, perhaps. Even the banners will tell you something about the identity of, um, of a movement or how, how protesters see themselves. The mottos they use, the slogans they, they, they chant, press releases in many cases, all these, uh, all these elements are, uh, and of course, we should not forget uh, social media accounts. Let's hope we, we won't lose Twitter in the next few days. Um, so my concluding remarks, uh, I think that frame analysis is a great method to bring together scholars who work on uh, party system populism and grassroots uh, populism. And I think this can, of course, I mean, the major, uh, major applications are usually qualitative, right? But um, through uh, text analysis, uh, there's, uh, I think there's, there's uh, I've published work uh, along those lines and I've seen uh, uh, others uh, work on this as well through text analysis. Uh, you can um, you can give a quantitative spin to um, uh, to frame uh, theory and how it's applied on populism in order to quantify uh, the phenomenon and come and, and reach comparative um, uh, results. Now I'm I'm posing this uh, as a question, but I really through through my research through my field research, I really felt like populism is sometimes more authentic at the grassroots level. You might of course, disagree. What I mean by this is that because the opportunistic element uh, or the, you know, the electoral element is absent with social movements, that allows, uh, you know, the language of populism to be expressed more, uh, more genuinely, I think. So, of course, the strategy, there's always strategy, even in social movements, they're always, you know, not, not explicitly uh, a leadership structure, but there, there are people who emerge as, as leaders at, at some point. But still, uh, the absence of um, you know urgent electoral uh, uh, responsibilities, let's put it this way, I think makes uh, the phenomenon more authentic. And I think we 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 do gain a lot by studying it uh, as it happens in in the streets rather than in in legislatures. Um, the normative question: Are they good? Or are they bad for democracy? I think it's it's open ended. Uh, 
I would, uh, I, I'm not on the side that says populism is inherently bad for democracy and its institutions. I wouldn't go the other way uh, either. Um, I do feel that uh, most grassroots movements, of course, you had things like, you know, the Tea Party, for instance, but most grassroots movements are uh, on, on more on the progressive side compared to uh, populist phenomena at the party system level around the world. I know Latin America is uh, uh, is a specific case where left wing populism is uh, is dominant, but you know, compare that to uh, to Europe, for instance. And I just uh, want to close with uh, reiterating my uh, my uh, you know my invitation uh, for a cross fertilization of sociology, political science, political theory, and other uh, sub disciplines uh, on the topic of populist contention, perhaps using uh, frame theory, frame analysis as 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 a tool. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. Amazing Paris. Uh, thank you so much for the for the, your presentation. So I give the um, the floor to my uh, colleague Israel Solorio from the Political Center at the at the Faculty of Political Social Science at UNAM. Uh, we have been working together like two years. So please close this. Well, uh, I don't know. I think that it's a very interesting presentation, and I'm quite sure that we will have some questions from part of the audience, uh, both in, inside the Zoom or also outside. But I will start uh, saying, Paris, first that you know that uh, your papers have been inspiration, uh, source of uh, um, reinforcing our theoretical framework for this research project. And probably one of the difference that we can have is that we have been thinking uh, this project popular mainly to understand what's going on in Mexican politics. And that's why also why uh, Dr. Uh, Ocho Espejo and many others have been part of this seminar. Mm -hmm. And I will ha I would like to to start with one I would say like a opening question, uh, and I would like to, to know your thoughts about this. I think that uh, this idea of the, uh, collective identities that you have developed, um, it basically, uh, I mean, it, it's a very well-developed idea that, uh, that, that explains uh, this uh, us uh, against the others that, that started with the, the idea of La Cloud. And I really like this. But I'm wondering about uh, if you have thought about the, the time span of these collective identities. Because, for example, if you, we think ab about uh, the movement of Indignados or you know, yeah. Street, they have problems uh, you know, over time to maintain these scores. Yeah. And if we think about, for example, this. Uh, and this Manuel Lopez Obrador and the movement Morena, it's every time more difficult to keep maintaining the, the union uh, within the, 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 the leader, the populist leader, and the ones who are following this discourse. So I'm thinking, for example, um, on my paper, uh, the paper that you read together with my colleagues, and this comparative feed. How is uh, how Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador and other other leaders in the region have, for example, over time, start to displacing indigenous people to the other yeah. side? Yeah. And what's the role for the comparative fit? I'm thinking, like, how how can they maintain this uh, idea of collective identity when, on the one hand, they are displacing movements uh, as the feminists? or the human rights defenders, uh, indigenous peoples, while at the same time to maintain power, they are doing alliances with the former members of the elite. So, uh, I mean, it's just, uh, I have many, too many ideas uh, right now, but I, I would like to start answering for you. No. Have you thought about this idea of the time span of collective identities and the challenge to maintain this uh, this discourse over time. Uh, this has been the case for Latin American governments, but I would like to know your opinion. Thank you very much, Paris. Thank you, Israel. Um, 
so of course uh grassroots populist uh, movements are very uh time limited usually they last from a few weeks to a few months uh and uh again usually the the reason for uh, for why they disappear is uh either some ident some uh, secondary identity starts claiming uh, you know, equal presence, like the feminist identity you mentioned, for instance, right? And the movement, you know, splits between because there are other people in there who don't want, you know, to 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 be in, in league with with the feminists, for instance, or with religious folk or with with nationalists. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, when they start uh, getting down to uh, policy, they they disagree, right? Because populist movements, uh, grassroots populist movements, are very um, diverse. They include people with different uh, ideologies, and uh, they manage to hide that under the carpet because of all these social psychological mechanisms we talked about. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's only about us, the people. You know, forget about everything else. We'll talk about policy when the time comes. But eventually, this time comes, right? Somebody will raise the issue of what do we do with uh, you know uh, taxes? What do we do with uh, you know constructing this highway that goes through indigenous lands, right? And that's when it gets uh, it gets tough, right? And of course, and of course, uh, it's it's almost impossible to keep a uh, a populist grassroots movement uh, going uh, uh, forever, right? But the um, examples you mentioned mostly have to do with uh, with in institutionalized uh, forms of uh, of populism, right? So a movement might decide to institutionalize itself into a political party, right? It might try to retain a populist discourse, but it doesn't mean that it will do it successfully. I mean, in the case you mentioned, obviously, uh, uh, AMLO has has lost the game in terms of uh, uniting uh, these uh, groups under a populist uh, collective identity. Right? There are fractures, there are fissures in the in the in the construct. Whether uh, whether he keeps using a populist discourse or not is not the, the question here. It doesn't answer our, our question, right? He might still be doing it. The question is whether he's doing it uh, effectively, right? Whether it's uh, still successful, whether it can still get him the votes, right? But that's extraneous to uh, to how populism uh, works. I think it has to do more with, um, you know, policy agendas and, and power politics. You know, I try to avoid this tendency when we have like a populist politician Right, and the politician gets elected, like Amlo, after all those years, you know, that he was trying. Everything that Amlo does is a populist act from then on. Right, I don't agree with that. Right, uh, I, I think populism is, is is discourse. Right, it's it, and, and that's it. What you do when you're in power, the policies that you will uh, uh, that you will follow might have a fit with what you would call, you know, populist invocation during the campaign, but not necessarily, right? Because then we're talking about, you know, partisan identities being most important, power play, uh, power politics, right? Populism takes uh, takes a second seat, I think, takes, takes a back seat compared to these uh, different um, uh, elements, right? So again, I, I, I want to avoid the tendency to... Uh, uh, to see as populist everything that a person who was voted as a populist and won power on using populist discourse does after he or she uh, wins power, right? Yeah. I'm not sure I completely answered your uh, your question, but I, I might have come close to that. No, of course, and of course we will have opportunity for a follow-up question. But in the meanwhile, I would like to ask to my other colleagues in, in the in the room if they want to 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 ask a question. I think that Jorge over here he has the the the, the hand raised. So please, Jorge. Hi, Paris. It's a pleasure to join us today. Uh, Okay, that's all. Just please go. Just uh, a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 one of you needs to turn off the speaker, right? Yes. So, okay, ven uh, acá. Ven acá, ven acá. I don't trust in my English, and I need to... No worries. 
I, I I'm not a fluent speaker either, so we're on the same <laughs> we're the same journey. But um, the question is, uh, different authors consider um, that the charismatic leader frames who are inside and outside the group to which he appeals appeals. But from your point of view, can the framing uh, also be bidirectional to the extent that certain sectors of society also feel identified with those values? If so, it would be necessary to discuss that those authors uh, who point out that people behave like a herd, talking away any capacity for agency. Right. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm going to talk mostly about the, the idea of the charismatic uh, leader here, which I, I, I kind of disagree with, right? I don't, I don't believe that uh, you need a charismatic leader in order to have uh, uh, populism. And yes, I think I agree with you uh, that um, these uh, these theories mostly see, uh, especially voters, as a, as a mass. Sometimes of you know, it, it goes back to Le Bon and all these uh, uh, psychological theories of uh, you know of the past, like a century ago who were talking about the ignorant masses and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and you know, that, that's my main contention uh, here. Uh, in that sort of, um, in that school of thought, where it's it's all about top-down populism, the people are non-existent. You know, they, they only cast their votes in elections. Maybe they're there in, in uh, campaign rallies, right? But the researchers never, you know, never approach them. It's like they don't exist. Their agency doesn't matter. In my opinion, uh, there is a uh, bidirectional uh, relationship between the political leader and uh, you know and, and the masses and the people and the voters. Uh, and we need to study both uh, you know both aspects here. We cannot rely solely on um, you know the discourse of the leader in order to understand what's going on at the, at the level of you know the individual voter. Thank you. I would like just to, to comment uh, something related on the, it's kind of a follow-up question because uh, I don't know if you, you know our colleague, uh, Flavia Freidenberg, who was also part of the seminar. Mm -hmm. And she has the idea of the populist citizenship, uh, uh, citizenship, sorry. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it resonates to something of what you're saying. And, uh, also in the audience is Cesar Alan Ruiz Galicia, who is, uh, he basically studies communication uh, and populist leaders. And I was thinking about, uh, if you have uh, thought about the idea of using also, also like social media, how these uh, actors, guardians of identity also are related to, to some sort of repression uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and attacks in, for example, in Twitter uh, that are affecting what we know of liberal democracy. Because at the end, I, I think that you have developed quite well all this idea of the collective identity, but it also relates to, to the, the related literature on, on liberal demo, illiberal democracy. So, uh, what have what are your thoughts on this regard related to the these guardians of identity that are attacking uh, journalists and people uh, in so, on social media? Well, it depends on whether you're talking about a uh, political party, I guess, or a, uh, a grassroots movement. Like um, I've studied the social media of Occupy Wall Street and the Spanish Ignatos and the Greek Ignatos and so on and so forth. There was uh, identity, you know, boundary framing there. Uh, there were attacks against people who, you know, would claim you, you know, you're not the people because this or that, right? Uh, but that's kind of expected. It's not necessarily oppressive because, you know, these movements have no power, really. But when you're talking about um, supporters of a, of a populist uh, party, for instance, uh, which is in power, perhaps, I guess that partisan identity is the most important factor here. I'm not sure it has a lot. To, I mean, yes, populist discourse might be, play a part, but it's mostly about... Uh, you know, protecting the um, uh, the electoral uh, prospects of the party by suppressing dissent within the party or by, uh, you know, uh, attacking opponents, right? So I guess you have specific examples in mind, 
and I'm not and but I need to know the context in order to you know answer more specifically but that, that's how I see it in general it has to do with power right if you know oppression comes from from those who hold power if if um if we're talking about a government agency for instance or a or a president uh, who using uh, his or her social media is trying to uh, 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 to crack down on, on different opinions. But of course, that's a different uh, story altogether. And of course, populism can be used as a tool here by claiming that, uh, you know, you, you, your voice is not legitimate because you're actually part of the elite, for instance, right? That could be an example. Um. I have a question, and I'm thinking about Morocco. About uh, what? Morocco, the oh. social movement. So, you know, do you remember 2011? I don't know. I don't remember. The Arab Spring. The Arab it was, Spring. It was part of the Arab Spring, right? If I remember. Of course. Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering when when you are talking about social movements and populism, um, but in in specific case of Morocco. There is some institutional engrenage that helped the, 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 the queen, the, sorry, the king, to yeah. incorporate the, all the demands from the social movements. Yeah. So we, we have this another example of how, yeah, social movements uh, make some uh, populist uh, speech or discourse. But what happened when you, you have an institutionality so strong that they incorporate the, all the demands? So, yeah. what happened with? Kind of social movement and all the populism discourse. Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm asking you. Uh, no, no, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, it's uh, you know what happens to populist movement. What, what's the outcome, right? So, uh, populist movements, uh, grassroots. We're talking about grassroots movements here. Uh, like in Iceland, they managed to topple the government. Uh, mm -hmm. The government fell because of you know the populist movement out in the streets. More or less, the same happened in uh, in Greece as well, right? Uh, but in other cases, uh, political parties, in, in democracies at least, find a way to co-opt the demands. Like Israel is a very uh, interesting case here. The government said to the, to the protesters, you know, you're free to join us and discuss your grievances. Please send us a list of grievances. And remember, the moment you ask for a list of grievances from a populist uh, 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 movement, things are getting tricky. What do you put? On the on paper as a grievance, all all the ideological differences start emerging, right? And other social differences, class differences, for instance. So that was that's a great trick. So you know the government will do something against the populist uh, movement that is trying to overthrow it, right? It has it has oppression, of course, as as a weapon, uh, like they they try to do in in Tunisia, for instance, and failed, right? Uh, but they, they can also. Uh, uh, try to divide the movement in two or three, you know, giving something that would uh, address specific grievances, but not every grievances. So some people leave the movement because they feel that, uh, you know, they are, you know, the grievances have been met. And in, uh, in case in kingdoms, uh, uh, specifically, as you said, there's, um, you know, there's a different sort of uh, sovereignty. So you have popular sovereignty, you have national sovereignty. But you also have royal sovereignty, and that complicates issues. Not everybody, perhaps, is an anti-monarchist in the uh, in the populist movement, right? So, if the if the issue of uh, of the royal family and it, it, its fate emerges, that might also divide the movement. Or in other cases, take um, take the is the Farahidos in uh, Ecuador. Am I pronouncing it right? So uh, this was a very interesting uh, populist uh, movement that got co-opted uh, uh, by, uh, by Korea, for instance, later on. So the idea is we take up the populist discourse of the movement and we express it at the electoral arena, right? Without necessarily paying respect to, to, you know, to the demands or, or the organization of the movement. And we will seek you know, electoral, uh, an electoral victory in, in that sense. I'm not sure exactly what uh, took place in uh, in Morocco. I don't remember the details, to be honest with you. I haven't studied this case uh, as thoroughly as other cases. Uh, but yes, um, populist movements uh, face the counterframing of the government, right, of the authorities. And it's not always easy to, uh, uh, to counter that, right? And governments, in many, many cases, manage to stifle movements 
not always in an oppressive uh, in an oppressive manner. They will uh, spread rumors about it. They will have their police informants that will uh, you know uncover dirt about a leader or something like that. There are so many ways that uh, governments traditionally react to uh, grassroots agitation, and that that works uh, the same with uh, with populist uh, movements. Thank you, Boris. Uh, we have a question um, from one of the students, member, member of the project, and she wants to know how is the construction of the identity of, of the populist identity in the process of framing? I, I mean, she meant how both processes are related, framing and the construction of the populist identity in, in, the, in the bottom, I think, related to, to the movement. Yeah. So uh, if we call it identity framing, uh, the idea here is that you uh, you start uh, emphasizing uh, the notion that we are all members of that social construct of the people, right? We're all the people, right? And against us, we have uh, these elites. Um, and our demands stem from uh, the fact uh, that our grievances are not being uh, served by the government and the government has turned against the people. So it's our right to be here because we we represent the the the, the value of popular sovereignty, right? And uh, and uh, the government is not our legitimate representative anymore, right? So you you start talking in terms of we all the time. That's that's the idea with uh, collective identity uh, framing. It all has to do with, an, especially in populist uh, discourse, with an all-inclusive we identity and not emphasizing particular grievances. You know, you can all come here with your grievances, the feminists, the environmentalists, uh, the workers, uh, you know, the, uh, the farmers and the students and so on and so forth, the pensioners, right? But we all need to remember that what, what brings us together is not our particular grievances, but the fact that these grievances are inscribed under this battle between people and elites, right? That's why they're so vigilant uh, about um, about populist identity, which I think it's I mean it's a great uh, it's a great tactic, right? And it's the only tactic that will keep a uh, a populist movement intact. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have just one follow-up question to, to all uh, probably I, I mean I, I know that you work on populism but um, I have a, here in the project we have a student working on also on policy narratives mm -hmm. and how have you considered this relationship between you know the populist discourse uh, policy narratives and the way they justify also certain policies Yes. It's a tricky question, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, you might not like what I'd say, but I think the core of populism doesn't have much to do with specific policy. If it had to do, if populism was wedded to specific policies, then indeed it would look like an ideology, right? So, uh, I mean, the policy prescription, the only policy prescription that populists can give is we will restore popular sovereignty. How we're going to do that is not clear. I mean, it's not easy for me to uh, associate uh, populism with a specific type of uh, foreign policy, for instance. I, I, I don't believe that populists are necessarily, uh, you know, hawks or, or doves. You know, they're not necessarily aggressive in foreign policy or, you know, or pacifists. Uh, same with, with distribution. I mean, in Latin America, we have so many cases like, uh, you know, Fujimori in Peru, uh, where uh, populist discourse was associated with you know, what you would call neoliberal uh, policies, right? Uh, I mean, it's Latin America that taught us uh, that populism and neoliberalism are not necessarily antithetical, right? Um, so I can't find a specific field. I mean, if, if, you, if you have something in mind, feel free to, to share it with me. I can't find a specific policy field where populism will point you to a specific agenda. Think of this uh, thought experiment. So you read in the news that in country X that you know nothing about, you know, there's a country X, you know, you know nothing about this country. You've never heard of this country before. Uh, a populist leader has won the election. 
that's it. That's the only information you have. Can you answer what kind of policies this populist leader will pursue? Not really, right? I mean, it depends on whether you would you would be um, uh, dealing with a right wing populist or a left. I mean, if though if that was added, the ideological element was added. If they had told you a left wing populist has won power, then yes, maybe you could say that I expect more redistribution of of income, right? If a right wing populist uh, was elected, you would claim uh, yes, I expect uh, stricter, I don't know, uh, immigration policies or something like that, but. If you're just told that a populist leader has one power in country X, there's really no way to attach a policy agenda with that, you know, with that limited information you have. And I think that that says a lot about the, the policy emptiness of, of the core notion of populism. I don't know if that sounded persuasive or not. <laughs> no, just to, I mean, to close up this part of the question, uh, probably not a policy specifically, but when you mention a policy agenda, I'm thinking about policy dismantling. And I think that policy dismantling might be a characteristic uh, from different governments, from different range of ideology, I mean, uh, uh, political spectrums. And I think that it's a challenge or also for uh, public policy studies to understand how this populist governments are um, uh, are boosting this uh, dismantling agenda and you mean dismantling of institutions and policies both of them so change and, when, when you say dismantling it sounds like it has like a normative content you mean in a bad way no not, just not in a way change. of changing the, the right. state change. of art yes right. yes yeah. sure sure yes populism has this radical element to it, right? So you do expect some radical changes in uh, in policies, but which direction? You're not sure. You need more information, right? About that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, wonderful conversation. Uh, if nobody has any questions, we have one. Well. Said, uh, please, Said, could you but Said ask? just, he was, let me admit him ah, because okay. his internet was failing. So I think that, because you have to know that we have, uh, it's not only our research, but we have also to, to, to produce some thesis, dissertations. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. So that's why we also, luck, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so we also have a, questions from students that are struggling with populism and frame analysis and all that. So that's why. Great. Yeah. 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 Ah, ah, I'm just... all ears. Said, could you ask yeah, no, no. a question? Oh. He, he wrote, so it's from Said. What is his thesis about? Dissertation about? Not, no, yet. not yet. Okay. Not yet. Could you say that policies are simply different tools that could be used by populist leaders in different ways? But there's no, not necessarily one kind of populist policies. I think it's kind, a kind of follow-up question. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I totally agree, uh, and I mean, I totally agree. Yes, uh, but uh, we shouldn't be, I guess, too strict about this, right? Because I mean, opportunistic politicians uh, can also be non-populists, right? I mean, let's take the American uh, example. It's not like people uh, promise something in the campaign trail and then they always implement it while in power. Sometimes they implement the opposite, right? Take Biden, for instance. You know, the Democrats were always railing against uh, um, uh, Trump's anti-China policies, right? But they keep following the anti-China policies of the previous administration. And you can come up with many other uh, uh, examples like that, right? Uh, or, or the Republicans, you know, forever have been uh, uh, accusing the Democrats of increasing uh, the deficit, right? And when Trump was in power, the deficit went through the roof and Republicans were okay with it, right? So this is partisan warfare, really. Policy, I mean, in general, I'm, uh, I'm very reluctant uh, to see policy as something concrete, right? Policy is, is always contextual. It has to do with it has to do with ideology, sure, yes, but uh, the, the, the major objective of a politician is to get elected or re-elected, right? Policies are just a tool 
for the uh, for the objective. I mean, that's what political science, uh, you know, will tell us at the end of the day. That's the the the, the selfish uh, element, the uh, the interest of of the politician, right? So we should not put um, you know rigid boundaries around policies and expect necessarily even a left-wing or a right-wing politician to follow uh, a specific uh, type of policy. And of course, for populists, it's even more difficult. You, you don't really know what to expect, right? Uh, and that's, that's, that's part, of the, uh, part of the allure of populism, in a way, I guess. Thank you very much, Paris. If you don't mind, uh, and if my, colleague, my colleagues and students don't mind, I would like to ask you a twofold question mm. as a kind of closing this. Sure. Uh, I, I will try not to abuse of your time, I'm sorry, but no worries. Uh, I'm wondering um, which difficulties have you faced at the moment of continue researching populism from a not normative perspective? And I'm thinking about, you know, the political difficulties of discussing about any political party, political leader, right. without making yourself into, into a big discussion on Twitter. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I tried to say, like, no, we can't study this without being a part of this dynamic that I'm explaining. And the second mm -hmm. part of the question is related to something that for me, uh, the populist frame is very useful to understand Latin American politics. Mm -hmm. But also we have, and we have had these discussions uh, within this uh, seminar, some authors just saying, we need to, to stop discussing, using the, the concept populism, because, you know, we, we have, uh, a kind of sartorius concept is uh, right it's stretching yeah yeah that populism is, is everything and yeah. we need to stop that and yeah. for me your theory enlightened us to better understand populism but that's at the same time you have some other colleagues saying no we should stop this so right. this is my twofold question i'm sorry uh, for this Thank no you. no of course the, the both uh, great question i'll start with the latter which is a bit easier um the fact that, yes, indeed, uh, populism is overstretched as a concept and we tend to use it everywhere. First of all, uh, uh, scholars of populism have always said that. I mean, you, you go back to the 1970s and you look at people studying American poly, uh, populism and they already say that, you know, we've been using this word too much, right? You know, you, you need, you need to, to, to put, a, uh, to put a, uh, a check on this. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, we should stop using it, right? Uh, we just need to be a bit perhaps uh, stricter about its application, but that doesn't mean it has lost its uh, currency. It might. I mean, if this goes on, if it keeps stretching uh, itself, yes, maybe it will break at some point, right? Uh, but I don't think uh, we're there yet. And I think that populism is a very uh, important uh, uh, way to understand pop political discourse. I I again, I won't say policies necessarily, but definitely how voters are persuaded, what makes people go out in the streets in order to protest against the government in a populist manner, which happens all the more uh, frequently. So by discarding the, the term uh, populism, I think we'll, uh, we'll lose more than we'll, uh, we'll win, right? And a, a solution out of that, perhaps, is to stop you to seeing populism as a binary concept. You're either a populist or you're not a populist, and that's it. It's black and white. No, my idea is that there are shades of populism, right? Uh, and, um, and that will normalize the concept. You know, it's not like we have the populist monsters or whatever, and the normal politicians, everybody else, right? Uh, I would say that many politicians, even those that, uh, you know, you would consider mainstream, do use populist discourse up to a point. Take Macron in France as an example, right? Uh, many, many other examples. I mean, even even Biden at some point uh, has you know populist elements, with folksy elements in his uh, in his discourse. But that doesn't, you know, we, we should stop necessarily uh, trying to categorize everybody into either a populist or a non-populist. Yes, some politicians use more populism in their discourse, and some use it less. It, generally, it's difficult to avoid 
every populist invocation out there because you know politicians because constituent moments are so important for national uh, 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 for for nation states we always like pay heed to the notion of popular sovereignty right well you cannot be a democrat and not pay heed to the notion of popular sovereignty the question is how far you go with it right so a non-binary understanding of uh uh, of populism would help in that respect. Now, on your first question, it's more difficult. I'm not saying I don't suffer from biases. Of course, I have my own politics, even though I'm a, I'm a huge skeptic. But in general, I do have political values, right? My uh, my invitation is to understand that we have biases uh, to uh, to be able to uh, identify them, even to express them openly, and go on from there. Right? Instead of hiding your biases behind a supposedly objective understanding of, of a, a political situation. You know, I'm a constructivist, right? I follow, uh, you know, a constructivist approach in my in my politics. I, I don't believe there's a there's a sole political truth out there, right? So I do have my uh, my values uh, and I will uh, never say I'm I'm objective, but I will try to uh, to do my work while being open about my uh, my biases and i think that's that's fair and that's uh the best we can do and yes i do get a lot of heat uh from others uh but I'm, i i try not to be very active on social media so <laughs> Awesome, Paris. Well, thank you so much for your time, you. for you. accepting our invitation. It was amazing to have this uh, open conversation with different questions, more questions than, <laughs> than the subject of the yeah. presentation. And well, I, maybe we can keep the, the, the final uh, uh, task that you said, why open, no? Um, some advice to scale of race of the concept of the populism it will be more important in order to understand more of the concept and, and how can how can we work with this? Um, so let me um, switch to the Spanish to <laughs> and then I, I return to you. Muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Eh, Esta, esta tarde ha sido para nosotros un honor tener a Paris Alamiris con nosotros y discutir mucho más, no solamente sobre movimientos sociales y populismo, sino todas las preguntas que nos, se nos ocurrieron y todas las dudas que tendríamos. Eh, para nosotros ha sido muy especial. Eh, quiero agradecer uh, la colaboración de cada uno de los estudiantes que formaron parte de este proyecto por su trabajo, por las tesis hechas y no hechas todavía. Eh, por She's talking los... about thesis and dissertation, so that's why we're very lucky. Um, por todos los colegas de diferentes latitudes del país y también de los que están afuera. Eh, muchísimas gracias por la colaboración interdisciplinaria entre los uh, profesores de diferentes centros de, de, de centros de la facultad ha sido eh, para mí un placer compartir contigo y con todos ustedes. Let me switch in English. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Barry, again for your presentation. For us, uh, was a very honor to close this session and this seminar with you because, as you can see, so for our is so important. You think about popul populism and not only social movement populism. Yes. Of course, of course, of course. A, a populism like a, like a concept. Don't blame you. <laughs> uh, so we are saying goodbye for everyone and, and thanks a lot for the students for the dissertation they are working on and the, the, the finish and they're not and um, also uh, thanks to my colleague my dear colleague and friend Israel Solorio for all the work that we are have been doing together also for all the professors from different parts of Mexico and also in the United States so uh, this is the closer session Sounds so exciting. I will try to run dog five. <laughs> but uh, again, thank you so much for your time and to share with uh, us. Your it was a joy. It was a joy. I'm really humbled uh, to learn that uh, you're using my, uh, my my work, at least partly, for uh, for your purposes. Uh, so congratulations. And I hope I'll, uh, I'll see you in person one day. Yeah, yeah sure. Please. No, it was a pleasure and hopefully next time we'll be in person with a beer after session and see you soon Paris. Thank you.